done, okay? It, uh, uh, David brought a passage of one of many in the Old Testament that have to do with Moses and Moses' life and activities. Uh, the Moses was rather a stellar figure in the Old Testament, and we've mentioned this before in a couple of different uh, aspects and opportunities, uh, but he was not only the national leader of Israel during that time, uh, but as we saw there, God used him to perform miracles as well. It was God's power, of course, but Moses was the vehicle that God had selected for that. Uh, there's all kinds of the plagues in Egypt. You know, you, you know, remember Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments. Uh, that, uh, and if you haven't watched that recently, go back and do so, uh, because it is uh, worth seeing, and it's uh, reasonably biblical top of everything else, but Moses was indeed a miracle worker, whether it was water from the rock or whether it was, you know, calling down manna from heaven, uh, whether it was the plagues of flies and locusts and darkness and, and so forth, Moses was certainly uh, a national figure and uh, somebody who the people talked about and dealt with. He was also a prophet. Uh, God used him to proclaim things as far as God's plan for the nation of Israel, both in the immediate future and in the extended future, uh, for the life of the nation uh, that came to that. Uh, he also had some rather distinctive things on top of that. He was uh, one of the few that's ever stood in the Shekinah glory of God's presence. Uh, he's on top of Mount Sinai. He, remember, he spent 40 days and nights up there where he received the, the, the tablets of stone and the commandments of God and everything that went with that. Uh, he also, humanly, he was the author of the Pentateuch. Now, that's a fancy word if you're not used to it. Penta simply means five. Uh, but the Pentateuch refers to the first five books of the Bible. Uh, and he was the human author. And you will, if you read through it with that perspective, you will glean some things that you see the culture of Israel at the time being picked up by the pen and personality of Moses that are then transposed into the written text that we enjoy today. He's also what we call the lawgiver. Uh, he was the one who the aforementioned Ten Commandments, the Tablets of Stone, and the entire mosaic system of laws, the do's and don'ts, commands and prohibitions that were part of that 600 plus uh, individual items, according to people who research that type of thing. Uh, but then there's one that almost nobody uh, is lists uh, if you're talking about Moses being used by God and in the life of God and that, how many people do you know were personally buried by God? That's pretty distinctive, but yet the end of the book of Deuteronomy clearly states that, you know, God was the one who took care of the body of Moses. There were different reasons for that. Uh, but yet, pretty distinctive. All of these, when you put them together, when you sandwich them uh, between the crusts, so to speak, uh, find that the Jewish nation had a tremendous reverence for Moses, as they did for Father Abraham uh, in a different fashion. For Moses, Moses was probably the stellar figure of the Old Testament, especially in the eyesight. Uh, and the view of the people of Israel. So a lot that is there. In fact, the Jews uh, felt that Moses was superior to the angels. Uh, there was a, a predominant feeling, you know, within the, the people of that era that he was superior. He, you know, you needed to listen to Moses more than angelic uh, revelation, so to speak, uh, everything that went with it. Uh, so they revered him highly. Interestingly, uh, and if you believe in coincidence, I'll use that term, coincidentally, uh, you find that the writer to the book of Hebrews opens the book almost immediately with the understanding that Christ was superior to the angels. Uh, and then uh, 
uh, as we get to today's text, you find a pretty clear teaching, and it's going to be reinforced next Lord's Day as well with his will, but the fact that Moses is superior, uh, or that Christ is superior to Moses as well. So you have two entities here, Moses and the angels, that the writer to the Hebrews is going to say uh, unequivocally that Jesus Christ is superior to either one of these most revered figures for the Jewish people that were struggling with coming out of the religion of Old Testament Judaism. And they saw what Jesus Christ had done in his earthly life. They saw what he was, his teaching that followed through the apostolic doctrine. Uh, they saw the miracles that were there. And they could see, really, some the spiritual benefits that seemed to be very appealing to many people coming out of Old Testament Judaism in that transition period of having to step from the Old Testament system to the New Testament system. Okay. And you know, before you think that this study in Hebrews is all about old dead people on the other side of the world that lived 2,000 years ago, stop and consider that we're not really short of religious people today. The churches, even today across America, are full of religious people. Not necessarily Christian, unfortunately, but religious. And it's really a struggle if you have been raised religious with all of the traditions and customs, protocols, and even the do's and don'ts of almost any religious system about how you do things and what you do and what is revered and what is honored and what isn't, when Christ comes by and says it's all done, obviously salvation becomes a real crux, doesn't it? Because religion says do and live. Christ comes by and says it's already been done, just believe it. And that's hard to make that transition when you have been raised that way and immersed in that thinking. So when the Jews, as recorded in the, the book of Hebrews, are what I've referred to, and you'll hear it over and over over the next few months, the bubble people, these are people that can see the benefits and the teachings of what they have tasted, the terminology used in Hebrews, of the goodness of God revealed in Christ. But man, it's just hard to break away from how you've been raised and what you've been taught and the culture of your family and your people to embrace the finished work of Christ. As the song, one of the songs we sang, the new and living way uh, that Christ provides, as I stated that way, that's right directly out of uh, chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews. So uh, let's read the first six verses of chapter three, just follow along. You know, as we do this, I better get out of Ephesians and get over here, otherwise it'll sound kind of funny. It, uh, it begins, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who is faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, Inasmuch as he who hath built the house has more honor than the house itself. Every house is built by someone, but he that builds all things is God. Moses truly was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken of afterwards. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house we are when we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Yeah, this is a very, it's kind of difficult to stop there because the entire chapter, you know, continues to build on this same subject. But frankly, there's just no way uh, somebody as 
dumb as I am, can possibly cover all the spiritual truths in the entire chapter, you know, in one Sunday. Uh, so bear with me when we look at the opening of verse 1 of this chapter, wherefore, as you recognize, that's a conclusionary statement. It's kind of like the therefores, you know, it's a, what is it there for? Right? And, uh, that's the idea of wherefore. It's actually a conclusion from the flow of, of the, especially the latter part of chapter 2, and especially the very end verses as chapter 2 talks about, again, Christ taking on humanity, becoming the God-man, God in the flesh, so that he could become the sacrifice for men's sins. Verse 17 uses another wherefore, King James especially, in all things it behooved him to be made like his brethren. Talk about his, his fellow human beings on the earth. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. <coughs> Keep that thought in things pertaining unto God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Dying on the cross for the sins of of mankind. And that high priest, you notice in chapter 3, that's the connection. Okay? Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Okay? Uh, holy brethren, partakers. Brethren is a church term, by the way. That's the way it's used in scripture. It's not used uh, of the Old Testament congregation, a religious group. Uh, they've got different terminology there. Uh, the holy brethren, hagios, the word we use for holy, uh, to, or set apart, uh, different derivatives, you wind up with the different nuances. Uh, you know, some people get caught up in this form of address, and they say, and you say, what are you talking about? Well, if you uh, talk about holy brethren, partakers, you know, of the, of the heavenly and so forth, you must be talking to Christians. No, I take issue with that. Though some take that point of view. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think you're talking to bubble people again. It's very similar to talking about the congregation. You know what I found when somebody talks about the congregation? They're talking about saved people, unsaved people, religious people, Agnostic, agnostics, occasionally even an atheist. They're talking about curiosity seekers. Uh, some of them have a real interest in the Word of God. Some of them don't really care. You know, they're there for the donuts. You know, or maybe the music, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, so it kind of a inclusive term that can include a broad range of humanity, not just limited to only save people. Okay. Uh, so that seems to be the very best way to understand what we are dealing with here. He talks about Christ being the apostle, again, with a capital A, uh, you know, in other words, the apostle. Uh, an apostle, you know, Steve mentioned this in kind of interestingly how God orchestrates the coordination of some of these things. And an apostle is a sent one. An apostle is an ambassador uh, for someone else. Okay? He's got a message from someone else to share. It's not his message per se. It is the message that he has been commissioned with to, as he is sent, to then relate to other people. Uh, and it talks about, it uses the term, and the high priest. It doesn't mean a whole lot to us. Now, if we have, depending upon our background, that terminology might pop out, you know, somebody in ecclesiastical robes, you know, uh, perhaps with a crucifix, you know, or collars or whatever it happens to be. That wasn't the term, that wasn't the, the biblical format of that. Uh, if you think about the context of what we're dealing with, uh, we're the writer of the book of Hebrews is relating this to the Old Testament picture of what a high priest would be. You know, 
that's what he and he understands that that's what the reader two thousand years ago in its context would instantly identify when you use the term high priest. You're talking about the appointed guy, beginning with Aaron in Moses' day, who was the high priest who, especially on the Day of Atonement, once a year event in the life of Israel, the high priest would go into the very Holy of Holies and sacrifice a blood offering on the mercy seat okay, for the sins of the nation. Now, you're going, if you're not familiar with it, well, think Indiana Jones, you know, and, you know, it's a, what, what was the first one? Uh, it's a lost ark. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, they had a very accurate depiction of the ark that they were raiders of, right? It's, uh, you know, how, how big it was. Well, what you had is the, had on the lid of that, all carved out of solid gold were two cherubim, the warrior angels, with their wings thrown forward, nearly touching, okay? Uh, and that area was only about probably this big, you know, in between and the center of the lid of that ark, that was where God's glory came down and lapped up, consumed the blood offering of the high priest who interceded between God's glory and the sinfulness of Israel so that the Jews could be spared from God's wrath you know, for another year's time. That's kind of a, the, a concise picture of what you're dealing with. That picture is what the Jews, the readers of the first century heavily influenced Jewish religious structure would automatically think of when he talked about high priest. That was the most significant action that the high priest would have performed for the benefit of the nation of Israel. Okay? And he says this... Christ is our high priest and our apostle okay, of our, and he uses the term profession. You may have in your translations confession. You, know, you confess, you profess, uh, and so forth, everything that goes with that. Uh, in other words, that is, the writer of Hebrews is saying, that Jesus Christ's high priesthood uh, and his apostolic sending by God the Father you know, to intercede for the sins of mankind, including the Jews, it was the really, that's the, that's the center point. That's the, the focal point you know, of Christ's ministry. On top of that, it's the focal point for about the next six or seven chapters of the book. Okay, is this Christ being our high priest and how he performs these different functions you know, for believers. Okay? It, uh, now, just as a thought, if we're going to profess knowing Jesus, our profession should probably agree with what God says about Jesus. Otherwise, at least one of us is wrong. I really don't think it's going to be God that's wrong. So, you know, you might want to go back and take a look at, you know, just what it is that is going on there, okay? Verse 2 talks about, in essence, the qualification of this apostle and high priest, this Jesus, this Christ Jesus. He, now, the King James uses was, who was faithful, actually it, it's the, the verb tense is, is present, so it means it's who is faithful, to him that appointed him, as also Moses was in all his house. Uh, the, whenever you run into italic words uh, in your Bibles, it means it's supplied. It wasn't in the original Greek or Hebrew text. It was supplied by the translators, and for the most part, they do a pretty good job. They're trying to kind of help the flow of language so you don't have start, stop, and the, and the confusion. 
So they supply a word here and there. Uh, but not always is that the case. Sometimes it helps if you leave those italic words out. Just be aware of it. And what happens here in verse 2 is uh, we are told uh, what is going on as far as the qualification of Christ and Moses in its context. It says they were faithful. I know this is not normal in our culture today. Our culture today says you've got to have a Ph.D. from a prestigious university. You know, uh, or he's got to have the right pedigree. And, uh, you know, well, over the years I've hunted behind pedigreed dogs a number of times. Some of which should have been left in the kennel. Okay, because they can't hunt. Then, you know, they don't have the nose, they don't have the desire. Uh, you know, the pedigree isn't necessarily a really good qualification. Is it? it doesn't really match it. You see, you can be credentialed, however you term that, whatever you throw in there. Or you can be qualified. Christ and Moses were qualified. Not because they were credentialed, but because they were faithful God is looking for faithful men to carry out his message, you know, and what his program is. He included Moses in that, and certainly Christ is the centerpiece for that, okay? Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Numbers. And that, you know, it's uh, one of those early books, you know, it uh, is in the Pentateuch that we talked about. In Numbers chapter 12, we don't, of course, have time to go into it in any depth at all, uh, but you have uh, a situation that just it tells us uh, that that came up uh, because Moses had married somebody that wasn't you know the, the the first choice of the rest of his family. He had a sister named Miriam and a brother named Aaron, right? That was Moses, uh, and he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said that, well, why is Moses, you know, doing all the, the preaching and teaching and the headship? You know, I mean, we've got, we're, we're pure racial Jewish stock here, and Moses went and married Ethiopian. It, uh, but verse 3 says, Moses was very meek above all the men on the face of the earth. Just as an aside, when the Bible uses the term meek, it has nothing to do with weak. It has everything to do with controlled strength. That's the biblical definition of meekness. Strength under control. Okay. Now it says, The Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron to Miriam and says, Come outside the camp here. I want to talk to you three. And they came out and God was there in a the pillar of fire at the door of the tabernacle, uh, and in verse 6, he says, Here, this is God speaking now out of the pillar of fire. It's going to get your attention. This is not an everyday thing. This is not, you know, catch a can sermon on Channel 7, uh, you know, and listen to some talking head, you know, preaching about a bunch of stuff he doesn't know much about. It, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision and speak to him in a dream. My servant Moses, not so, who is faithful in all my house. Notice how he's described there in verse 7. Faithful in all my house. With him I will speak mouth to mouth. It's a term euphemism for face to face. Okay, no go-between, no hiding around the corner, behind the rock, you know, or getting the message over the internet or on, on your texting or whatever. No, he said, I'm not going to use dark speeches. Uh, and the similitude of the Lord, he will behold, wherefore, when they were not afraid to speak against my servant Moses, his servanthood. And God was a little irritated at the whole thing and turned Miriam into a leper. And Moses prayed to intercede uh, 
Uh, and the whole story is fascinating. But you, know, you kind of get the idea as you turn back to the third chapter of the book of Hebrews, what is going on here. Uh, God's record by his own statements is that Moses was faithful. Okay? He was a faithful man. It, uh, it tells us in Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in the first letter in chapter 4 verse 2 and said it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And he's talking in his context about the leadership uh, involved in early Christianity but I think the principle applies everywhere. Primary characteristic, faithfulness. You know, it, you know, how many of you really appreciate fair weather friends? You know, people that are always there when you don't need them, but when you have a difficulty, they don't seem to ever be there. You know, uh, that's not the people you really value, is it? As you struggle with different situations in life, uh, God is looking for faithful people. Okay? And notice he says in verse 2 that Christ is. Uh, uh, you know, the, it's a present tense, you know, in the, you know, not a past tense in the grammar of, of the Greek language, uh, but a present tense. Uh, in effect, what he's saying is Old Testament Judaism, the old religion, as a earthly calling to a ministry that promises inheritance, where Christianity is a heavenly calling to ministry that guarantees an inheritance. That's the distinctive that is there. Well, verses 3 and following, I'm just going to kind of lump most of them together here for the sake of time, uh, talks about the contrast between Moses and Christ. Please come away with the recognition that God is not bad-mouthing Moses. He's not saying Moses was a failure or Moses didn't measure up. What he's talking about is the superiority of Christ as compared to Moses. Even though Moses was an amazing individual, you know, used by God as the stellar figure you know, of at least the early, if not the entire Old Testament, uh, and so forth. It says, Moses in his house. Have you seen that? Uh, it says in verse 3, For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, speaking of Christ, inasmuch as he who hath built the house has more honor than the house itself. You know, we take a look at something that's a fantastic house, and we think of, who built that? We don't fall down and worship the house itself. You know? We recognize that there had to be a designer and a builder and somebody that put the time and the effort into bringing such a wonderful house together. Now, I'm going to just pop your bubble here for you. He's not talking about the Taj Mahal. He's not talking about the hovel that you might live in. What he is talking about is the household of God. Okay? That's what he, when he talks about the house, he's talking about a spiritual house, a spiritual entity, not a physical structure. And he says Moses was indeed faithful in his house, but if you notice, it goes on and says, but Christ is faithful over his house, okay? the household that is there. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 at the end of the chapter, Paul writes to the church there at Ephesus and tells them very clearly that the house, the household in its true statement you know, of believers is being built with the apostles and the prophets Okay, as the first layer with Christ as the foundation. And there is being built. Kind of like now for 20 centuries, one level at a time, you know, God is building upon the foundation of Christ and the apostles. You know, the teaching and the miracles and everything that went with that. That's kind of the, 
the uh, idea. Moses being faithful, by the way, if you read it, is in Christ's building. Okay? And it's never stated the other way. Okay? It, uh, in verse 5, it goes this way, and it talks about how it's stated. Moses truly was faithful in all his, his house as a servant and was a testimony for those things which were going to come by later and would be spoken of and recorded. Okay? But Christ as a son over his own house. Okay? Little words that make quite a bit of difference. Uh, now, most of us, when we think of the word servant, okay, we're not talking about the waitress who brings you another cup of coffee and serves you. Uh, while that could be a picture and application in some ways, we often think of something that Steve also brought out in Sunday school class, you know, concerning the first part of Acts 6, you know, where you had the, the, the diakonos uh, group of servants. Okay, there are, according to sources, according to the people that do the vocabulary, like Bynes expository dictionary, there are in the New Testament six different words used for servant. Okay? Uh, diakonos is one of them. It's the word we get deacon from. Uh, the word deacon refers to the work of a servant, accomplishing a task. The, another very common usage is the word doulos. Uh, Paul talked about himself in the opening verses of Romans, for instance, as a doulos. Okay, uh, do loss has to do, uh, in, you know, uh, with a little bit different. Uh, that is a slave that's under a master. Okay, that's the, the, the term. That's in other words, there's slightly different nuances to the application of them. This word is neither of those. Those are probably make up at least ninety-five percent of the term servant. Found anywhere in the English translations in the New Testament. Yeah, this word here is therapon. It's only used once. Guess where? Right here. Okay? And it's got a nuance to it as well. The nuance here is being a freed slave. A slave who had been freed and was now serving his master as a freed man. And that is the reference that is used here. Moses was a freed man, but his service was not because his master ordered him to, but out of a love relationship where he chose to serve. Okay. But cut the icing, he's still a servant. Speaking of Moses, he's still a servant. Okay. He still has a, even though he's a great man, Moses, and he did so much, and he's referred to here as a theropon servant, he is still, in fact, a servant. Okay. The point is really in the context of the letter is to hold on to Judaism, and you can just substitute hold on to religion, is holding on to a shadow, okay? Where holding on to Christ, or Christianity, if you want the, the term, is holding on to eternal reality. Okay? One, it tells us, speaks of what is going to come. Okay? At the end, what, verse 5, isn't it? Isn't that right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, a testimony of those things which were to be spoken of afterwards. In other words, things still in progress to be laid out. That is what is being pictured here. Okay? The maturion, the word we get martyr from, used in Acts 1 and so forth in different forms. Okay? Uh, it's that the shadow versus the reality, and that's the way verse 6 is. Christ as a son over his own house. In other words, Christ built his own house as a son and not as a servant. 
compared to Moses, who acted upon orders and was told what to do, where to go, and how to do it, okay? and granted the power to accomplish those things by God's provision. Christ, being God, falls into a whole different category. Moses built the tabernacle, right? I mean, he's the, the guy who received the plans that God gave him from heaven, the blueprints, and he caused people to build it the way God had designed it. it wasn't his house. He didn't design it. You know, but he saw that it got built. But Christ is the one who builds the church, not dependent upon anything else except his own architectural capability as God, as divine. Okay? In the household of God, Christ is over the household of all believers, of all ages. Okay? What the writer of Hebrews is showing is the superiority of Christ. Even though Moses was great, and he's not faulting Moses because he did what he was supposed to. He was, in fact, faithful, but Christ is superior. Okay. Here's the test at the end of verse 6. Okay. Final thoughts here. Whose house we are, and the, the if, you've got a King James, it's got if. That's a conditional if. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. It, it, it's kind of, you know, confusing a little bit. I mean, yeah, you think, how many languages have to have three different words for if? You know, well, they've got six for servant. You know, uh, you know, the English language or American English in its own way is just as convoluted in a lot of things. We don't have time to go into the examples, but you get the idea, I think. But here it's the idea, it's the conditional, the eon word. It's the conditional word. It means that there's an unfulfilled situation. Okay? If the pastor ever gets done speaking, we'll be able to get home and eat lunch. If. Now, that's an unfulfilled hope. Or never mind. It's a, it's a, if we hold fast. Okay? Yeah, it's conditional. He says, if we do this, then this is going to result. You know? It's not since, because since this, then that's guaranteed. No, if we do this, then, but if we don't, then you've got a different result. That's, that's the distinctive in this particular word. Okay? He's not talking about anything except the reality of possessing biblical salvation. And he says it's going to be demonstrated by faithfulness. Now, salvation is God's business okay, uh, in its ultimate sense. But the demonstration of a person's salvation is how they live. James, in chapter 2, uh, said very clearly, he said, you say you have faith. I'll show you my faith by my works. Now, James did, he was the pastor of the Christian church in Jerusalem at the time. Yeah, he was the half-brother of Jesus in the earthly sense. Okay. James did not say, I'm getting saved because, I've, because of my works, because I'm a goody two-shoes, or I give a lot of money, or I you know, it, uh, you know, do a lot of praying or anything else. No, uh, he said, it's not my works that save me. But because I am saved, my works will demonstrate that I am. In other words, if you're going to claim it, you've got to live it. Walk the talk. You know, because that's what manifests. Now, just because you do good stuff doesn't earn you your way to heaven. No, it, uh, at all. But all kinds of things that go with it. You remember the parable of the soils? Uh, Luke chapter 8, for instance, says there's three times, the, 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 the word of God is the seed and Christ is disseminating the seed and it falls on a variety of soil types, but there's only one of those. There's the rocky ground and the parched ground and the thorn infested ground and then there's the good stuff and it's the good stuff that actually produces tenfold, hundredfold, fiftyfold. Uh, so just being a soil type isn't good enough. 
as being the right soil type. But you know the you know kind of you can refer back to that as well. James went on and said, "Faith without works is dead, being alone. Never said that works save you, but works always accompany a saving faith. Somebody who says their faith, who says they're saved, and doesn't produce Christian works." Their profession, as the writer of Hebrews in chapter verse 1 says here, their profession is a bit suspect, isn't it? It really is. Uh, you know, kind of be careful that you don't judge, but that's the way it works. So he tells us the concept being taught is to rejoice in the hope of God's promises to the very end of our lives. Again, talked about fair weather friends. Yeah. I've had people come up and tell me that they are never coming back to church. I said, why is that? I said, well, because I had, and this is a true story, a lady told me I had $160,000 in the stock market. And when the big tech crash went down, the tech bubble went down 20 odd years ago, she said, I lost three fourths of it. And if God's going to treat me like that, I have no use for him. And that doesn't indicate a true re relationship to God because it's not about the money, and it's not about the stuff. And the poor lady just did not have a biblical grasp of what Christianity was. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Confidence and rejoicing. See how the verse closes? Bear with me just for a moment. We'll finish here. Okay. We hold fast the confidence. That means confident expectation and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Chapter 10 talks about that in detail. We'll, we'll talk about it when we get there. But rejoicing doesn't say you're going to be happy with the result. Happy is an emotion. Joy is a position. Joy you can cling to because God promised it. And we rejoice in what God has promised. It may drag you through the sewer. They have difficult times. You know, they have health issues, financial issues, marital issues, you name it. Okay? And certainly we're not happy about that stuff from the human emotional sense. But God has promised, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We can rejoice in a verse like that. Okay? He also, by the way, promised that in the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. We, like, we really like the back half of that. We're not so keen on the front part, the tribulation part. Right? Yeah. So let's close. Religion today. Religion today is kind of like a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that's not there. All right? Uh, religion is groping about, looking for vindication for their own value. I'm worth going to heaven because I'm better than Luke Reilly. Well, who isn't? You know, it's a, you know, I mean, you know, Luke and I know each other. You know, it, you know it, we're, we're looking for, I, well, because of, so, or I give a lot of money to the Girl Scouts, you know, at Christmas time for the mint cookies and stuff. You know, therefore, you know, and you pat yourself and you try to polish your halo, whatever it is. You know, and I think religion says, I'll bet if I really give money or do something spectacular that that will make me worthy of heaven. That's not there. No. Uh, Christianity comes by and says, no, God did it all through Christ. What God expects is that you believe it. Okay? Not working for it, but simply accepting it by faith. See, whether it's 2,000 years ago, as recorded in the book of Hebrews, is whether it's today. Mankind has the same struggle with leaving religion that says, do, 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 and maybe you'll live, 
compared to Christianity that says it's already all been done. All you have to do is believe. Father, thank you as we bow before you, the great sovereign and most holy God, that you've granted us the privilege of a few minutes in this passage so that we might understand your plan and purpose for mankind and how you have provided a fix for religion and presented Christianity through what Christ has done. And we praise you in his name. Amen. Ladies.